In this segment, we're going to talk about synchronization and the tools we use to achieve it. You've all heard innumerous Hollywood action heroes saying those famous words, gentlemen, synchronize your watches, which actually makes sense since watches, mechanical timepieces to be carried on the wrist, were first produced at a large scale for the soldiers in World War I so that their movements could be planned and timed, in other words, synchronized, based on this single example, we already recognize that watches are not the only thing being synchronized, so are lives. In this case, the lives of soldiers on the battlefield in what will stand the most bloody war in human history. Furthermore, watches deal with clock time. And clock time, or mechanical time, is but one specific technologically produced form of time at work in human societies. In the period we are used to calling modernity or the modern. Studies of time in human and social sciences usually begin by making a distinction between two forms of time. One that is absolute, mathematical and mechanical, often referred to as clock time and another that is event and action based, relative and phenomenological, called experience time or social time. In a way, these are helpful distinctions, only they tend to make us forget the fact that time is a much more complex, multifarious phenomenon which cannot be contained within this kind of simple dichotomy. Times that are conceived as absolute and homogeneous are often the result of intricate and demanding procedures. To make time takes work, be it, be it Greenwich Means time or the idea of progress. Synchronization, which we're going to talk about here, is one possible name for this kind of work. Only the tools of synchronization we're going to deal with here is not the mechanical timepieces of World War I, but something completely different. A specific kind of diagram, a table. And what is synchronized is not the movement of bodies across the battlefield, but world history. The word synchronize is composed by the Greek prefix syn, meaning together, and the word for time, chronos. And thus, in its transitive form, refers to actions and activities that cause something to happen together, to coincide, to occur or to unfold at the same time to be, as we say, in sync. But the synchronization of the world, I argue, is not necessarily linked to the introduction of Greenwich Mean Time, nor does it depend entirely on the history of timekeeping and communication technology. The numerous attempts at synchronizing the world discussed here are not performed by watches, planes and social media, but by a set of practices developed in the early modern Respublica Literaria, the Literary Republic. Synchronization as a historiographical tool and in the widest sense, a literary practice starts in Greek and Roman antiquity. However, the particular textual and indeed diagrammatical forms that we'll discuss here emerge in the 17th and 18th centuries. I'll begin by presenting you with a small book printed in 1783 in Bergen, Norway, by the mathematician and schoolmaster Frederick Ludwig Holberg Arendts. The book contains a table, and nothing else. 24 pages long, divided into columns, filled with names and short fragments of text. At the top of the table, as you can see, there are names of peoples and nations. The Israelis, Upper Asia, Egypt, Lower Asia, etc. And at the far left is a timeline counting the Anno Mundi, the years gone by since the beginning of the world. The book has no preface or introduction, but on the first page there's, page there's a small passage printed in the bottom left corner. The title of this passage reads Tables of Universal History. And underneath, underneath it the schoolmaster gives the shortest possible explanation, in Norwegian of course, of how the table should be used and how it can help the students in understanding universal history. The table he writes helps the eyes in recognizing coherence in the history of a particular people, but it also helps in recognizing the synchronism with other kingdoms. Furthermore, he continues in the same text, it gives every event its proper place, so order and synchronism can be acknowledged. So in his explanatory note, Arendt uses synchronism as a name for a specific way of looking at the world and understanding world history, which doesn't limit itself to one tradition, one culture, or indeed one history, 
as represented by any single one of these vertical columns you can see in the table, but which demands a horizontal perspective across cultural and indeed geographical borders, and hence across boundaries between different histories and different historical times. When Arendt published his work in the city of Bergen, Norway, at the far northern periphery of the European Enlightenment, applying the genre of the so-called synchronistic table, he can be said to participate in a particular moment in the history of historiography. Described by Catherine Colliot-Hélène as a brief instant when the chronological order of traditional Christian historiography had lost much of its dominance, whereas the profane teleology of progress was still not in place. Until the Renaissance, chronology and chronological tables had a dogmatic function. Their main goals were twofold. On the one hand, to synchronize all other chronologies, traditions and narratives with the chronology of biblical history and Christian eschatology. In itself a product of an ingenious work to synchronize the different chronologies at work in the Bible. On the, other hand, on the other hand, to prove that no other culture was older than Christianity and that the histories of the pagan nations started much later than the histories of the nations of the Bible. But at the beginning of the 17th century, this was all about to change. A different understanding of the multiple times of universal history can be found in synchronistic tables introduced at European universities. One of the earliest and most decisive examples, at least in the German context, was the Theatrum Historicum by the grammarian and chronologist Christoph Martin Helwig from the University of Gießen, first published in 1609. Helwig's tables became extremely controversial due to his inclusion of Johann Justus Scaliger's list of the Egyptian kings, questioning not just the head start of Jewish history, but also the dating of the flood and even creation itself. They were also extremely popular and were still in print at the end of the century. In addition to inventing a new practice of teaching, Helwig is one of the first and undoubtedly the most influential to combine formal chronologies made up of columns of numbers alongside each other, as you can see here, with a wealth of historical information, names of important people and events. This table also offers a striking visualization of the head start of Jewish history, since for several pages the columns for pagan history are just blank. In his Theatrum, uh, Helwig created a diagrammatic structure that will be used in similar works all through the 17th and 18th centuries. For readers at the time, Grafton and Rosenberg have recently argued time looked like a table, preferably one subdivided into squares and horizontal axes. Already in the 1640s, however, Helwig's Theatrum was challenged and partly replaced by another table, Christoph Schrader's Tabulae Chronologicae, published in 1642 and 1645. The tables composed by the Professor of Rhetorics and li uh, re Librarian at the University of Helmstedt were the most widely used synchronistic tables in the 17th and 18th centuries, and was published in no less than 24 editions, the last one in 1765 more than a hundred years later. Compared to Helwig's Theatrum, Schrader's tables represent a, a significant simplification. At the beginning of the work, Schrader only enters two columns, for, for sacred and political history. In the latter parts, other columns are added, containing different na national histories, as well as lists of famous men. Schrader also adds a column entitled Varia, in which facts and events which do not fit the other columns are placed. Both, both Schrader and another portent author of synchronistic tables, Johann Joachim Kula, stayed with the diagrammatic format, the grid that Helwig had invented. But in 1729, a new set of tables was published, which did something completely, radically different. In Theodor Berger's Synchronistische Universalhistorie der vornehmsten Europäischen Reiche und Staaten, Synchronistic Universal History of the Most Illustrious European Empires and States, the diagrammatic logic of the table, the parallelism of columns and the verticality of rows is challenged, even eclipsed by another logic, another form of temporality, if you like, which emerged in the 18th century and will become the main temporal form of modern historiography in the century to come, the narrative. No other historiographical work published in the 18th century shows better than Berger's 
Burgess tables how the logic of the narrative, a diachronic succession of events linked by causality, suppressed the synchronic view. In Burgess tables, the space of the columns become the space of narrative. So as you can see, the narrative is represented, told if you want, vertically, within the narrow framework of the column. The upper part is filled with the narrative itself, the lower part with the footnotes. The columns themselves are familiar, handed down in the tradition of chronological works from Helvig and Schroeder, but the contents of the columns are no longer names or keywords represented, uh, representing the most important persons and events in tabular shorthand. They're full-fledged, absolutely diachronic narratives, including footnotes. The narrative, the paradigmatic form of modern historiography, has made its way into the table and is about to deconstruct it from within. A table full of parallel na narratives does not help the eyes in recognizing synchronism with other kingdoms, to use Arendt's phrase. On the contrary, any attempt to make a horizontal glance into another column will create only confusion, jumping from one narrative to another as if there were two moving trains in one of Einstein's theoretical experiments. History as represented by Berger, is not only strictly diachronic, but at the same time, and due to the same diagrammatic framework, strictly national. Students are asked to recognize and learn national narratives, remaining well within the boundaries of the nation states, in the forms of columns, where synchronism moving horizontally across the vertical lines of the table, as well as across geographical national borders, is rendered more or less impossible and obsolete. So, to finish this segment, we're going to look at one last attempt to save the synchronistic table, and generally the practice of synchronism from the rise of the narrative, and in a sense, from the rise of historicism. Responsible for this attempt was the professor of history in Göttingen and the herald of modern German historiography, Johann Christoph Gatra. In 1772, Gathre pub published what was until then his most comprehensive work in universal history, his two-volume Einleitung in die Synchronistische Universalgeschichte, Introduction to Synchronistic Universal History. In an earlier programmatic essay, Gathre had argued that the only way to present, teach and understand the synchronism of global history is by means of tables. However, none of the existing tables, and he explicitly mentioned both Schrader and Berger, could do the trick. The ones by Berger are the best, he concludes, but unfortunately they're overloaded with narratives, very cumbersome and hard to use, he writes. There's only one way to remedy this obvious didactical shortcoming. He has to make his own. This is the reason why Gatra presents his almost 1300 pages long work in universal history as nothing but an explanation, a commentary, or as he calls it elsewhere, a dictata, a dictation, accompanying his synchronistic tables, the real piece of work, six of them, published six years earlier in 1766. Two of the tables are extremely different from everything we've seen so far. They carry the Latin, Latin title Durationem Populorum Regnorum Civitatum Intens, the duration of nation, states, and cities. In each table, there's a series of columns in different colors and of different length and width, representing states, peoples, or nations. In the middle, there's a black column representing the timeline. At every hundred years, a thin black line crosses the entire space of the table, dividing all the columns, including the timeline itself, into boxes, in accordance with the visual conventions handed down from Helvig. In the first table, which is the one you see here, uh, the horizontal succession of columns starts with China on the far left and ends with Denmark, Sweden and Norway in the bottom corner of the far right. And as you can see, in each column there are a few handwritten words representing individuals, mostly rulers, and important events, such as in a column representing Hebrew history, the birth of Abraham and the reign of Saul, or in Macedonian history, the reign of Alexander the Great. In the column representing Japanese history, there's only one entry, Dairi, which marks the beginning of the Dairi dynasty around the year 5500 5, 5, after the beginning of the world.
Broader columns represent systems of rule, as Gatro also calls them, systems of sub subjection. The Babylonian Assyrian, the Persian, the Macedonian and the Roman. These logics of power are also reflected in the choice of colors. The powerful ruling nations are in red, the dependent in yellow, etc. Both the separate publication of synchronic tables and narrative text and the absence of a user's manual indicate a specific historical and pragmatic context. The students were supposed to bring their tables along to the lectures in order to better, better follow the grand narratives, the dictata, the dictation of their professors. In this way, they were able to orient themselves in the multiple temporalities of world history to notice the synchronisms of different times and narratives. Compared to Schrader and Berger, Gatra's tables also involve another striking shift. The traditional columns were empty rectangular spaces forming a grid waiting to be filled with historical information. But Gatra transforms them into something more like pillars, with a top and a bottom, a beginning and an end, filled not primarily by names or events, but by colors. Thus, these pillars no longer function primarily as containers of history, as historical lives or, or events, but as visualizations of time itself. Or maybe rather, of the passing of time, as indicated by Gatra's own preferred term durationem, durations, thus anticipating the French philosopher Henri Bergson. As opposed to Newtonian time, described as absolute, true and mathematical, without regard to anything external, there is nothing absolute, or even homogeneous, or singular, about the time emerging in Gatra's tables. On the contrary, time and the tables remain plural, heterogeneous, and absolutely dependent on external factors, like geography, culture and politics. Both Berger and Gatra wants to use the table to represent history in motion, history as movement and process. But where Berger chooses the contents of history, the events and lives, and transforms them into narratives, Gatra turns his attention to time itself in its plural form. Together, however, Berger's and Gatra's tables mark the end of the brief instant in the history of historiography when the plurality of times was still a fact to be reckoned with and the synchronistic tables were needed to keep track of everything that was going on in the world at the same time. For the next almost 250 years, the homogeneous, linear time of progress, a very different paradigm of synchronization, would reign supreme.